But this morning we're gonna talk about mission and vision. Now I know that some of you may be sitting there going, mission and vision? I mean, can't we just talk about getting into heaven? Can't we just talk about loving Jesus? I mean, do we really have to talk about this stuff, about mission and vision? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. To not talk about mission and vision is to ignore the call to live a purposeful life. That is not what the church is all about. I don't mean to be offensive here, but I want to be really clear here. The church is not a collection of people that are doing just enough to get into heaven. If that's what your view of the church is, you've, you're missing it. Completely. God wants more for us. We were created for more. And honestly, based upon the fact of everything that Christ has done in our lives, you and I ought to want for more as well. We ought to want to be the people that God created us to be. We ought to desperately be searching for how do I fulfill the purpose that he has for my life? Now, to do that, though, means that you and I are going to have to embrace the mission that Jesus left us with. Now, a lot of churches have mission statements, and I'm not here to debate back and forth how the usage of words and all those type of things, that's fine. I, I really mean it when I say this. Our prayer here, my prayer here is that God would fill up all of the churches here that preach the gospel. That's what we want. That's our hope and prayer. Ours included in the middle of all that. We just simply believe that Jesus is the only one that can really give the mission statement. And so we go back into the scriptures and we believe that the mission statement of the church is wrapped up into two things. It's wrapped up, first of all, into the great commandment, which is love God and love people. And then the second part is the great commission, go and make disciples. And so it's a very simple statement. Love God, love people, make disciples. It is the why we believe we exist as a church. The question is, how do you live it out? How do you live out the mission? Well, this is where a vision sort of a vision statement sort of comes into to play here. A vision statement is how are we going to fulfill our mission? And it gives us our task and our target and our destination. It drives every single thing that we do programming-wise. In fact, I will tell you, there is not a single thing that we do. We don't spend a dollar or, or put a person on anything that doesn't fit within what our vision is all about because we want every single thing we do to ultimately lead to the place where people will come to know Jesus and be equipped to walk with him for a lifetime. That's it. Sometimes it means we, we have to say no to something that's really a good thing. And we don't mean to, like, to, you know, to be angry or mean or anything like that at all. It just simply means that every single thing has to have a purpose with us. Equip matters to us. It is the vision of the church to equip the church to follow Jesus. That is our vision statement. Now, equip is our task, and we believe it is the task of everyone in the church. In fact, let me show you something. Take your Bibles, and I want you to open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, incredibly important statement that, that's made here in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Paul writes here and he says, starting in verse 11, and it says, and he, talking about the Father, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now here's what I want you to notice, okay? This is very important you catch this. When Paul wrote this, what he in fact did was, he took every single servant within the church at that point and put them on a spectrum. In one sense, you got the apostles over here all the way to the shepherds. But the point is, is that every single person that serves within the church ought to be about the business of equipping people. Now, the spectrum's changed a little bit. We don't have apostles today. Back in those days, you had apostles because Jesus actually physically walked on the earth and said, I'm going to have you, Paul Sweck, be this person that's going to go do this job. 
That was an apostolic calling right there. But the fact that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father tells me he's not doing that today. It doesn't matter. We still have the same calling because we have God's word to let us know exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And so the, the point is, is that everybody that fits within the spectrum in a church has the ability to do ministry. Every servant. Every person is supposed to learn what the evangelists, what the shepherds, what the teachers are supposed to do. Whether you're greeting at a door, whether you're leading a small group, whether you take groups down to Mexico and lead in the whole this thing, all of it is about training up people to do the same things that we do and be successful at it for the kingdom's sake. You know, it's interesting out of the 14 times the Greek word or karamazos, which is the word we get equipped from, is used, 13 of those are verbs. They're action words. Let me give you an example. Jesus in Luke chapter 6, verse 40 says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is karamazos, fully trained here, he says, same root there, will be like his teacher. 1 Thessalonians 3, 10 says, and as we pray most earnestly night and day that you may see your face, you face to face and supply karamasos, quip, okay? What is lacking in your faith? The author of Hebrews even used it in his benediction. A benediction is a really nice religious word for saying this is his prayer for you. This is the prayer he's praying for us, Okay? The writer says this, and now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. That's the point. We are equipped to do God's will. To equip is to give the appropriate resource, training, models, accountability, all of it. In fact, if I can give you a, an example for some of you maybe that are not sort of in that realm yet, maybe some of you students are thinking about, hey, I'd like to go off to college maybe and be a doctor one day. Okay, so that's, what, that's my desire is someday is to be, you know, an MD, a doctor. And so, you know, you go and you apply for the right school and you get in and, and while you're there, you know, you're studying and you're learning about biology and, and chemistry and all those things and how they all work together and then if your grades are really good enough, you know, hopefully they will be, then you get into medical school and then beyond medical school, you would go even a step further and you would do residency and when you come out, they give you the white coat and you are ready to, to practice medicine but only because along the way, you learned all those things that needed to be learned. You learned how biology works. You you learned how it mixes with chemistry. You learned all those things, and along the way, they provided models for you. You watched someone doing what it took to make it happen. You, you were there, you saw it, you got to look over the shoulder. Sometimes they might even have handed you something and said, you do this here. But you did those things, and you learned what it meant to be a servant like that. That's equipping. And it's a biblical model. You know, the Apostle Paul affirmed that in 2 Timothy 2, 2. He says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, in trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So God, in effect, what he does is he takes the messages that we've heard and the models that we have observed and he equips us to do better. Equipping is a part of multiplying believers. It's helping believers grow to become Christ-like. It's making disciples. Do you know what the word disciple means? Follower. It's making more followers. You know, it's interesting, you know, when, we, when I mention the word disciple, so many people have this thought like, oh my gosh, he's gonna talk about something like it's, like these are like the special forces Christians, man. I mean, the disciples, they are, they're not like everybody else, you know. They don't ever sleep. They just are in the Bible like 20 hours a day. Uh, no, that's, that's really not it. I mean, some, someone will come along and say, you know, hey, listen, I, 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 you know, I'm thinking about being in discipleship. Wow. God bless you. You know, fifth door down on the right, we'll be praying for you. No. 
It's not some special program that, that just is set apart from every other thing. You know, being equipped to be a disciple is what every single believer does. Disciple making, multiplying is what we're all about. We're all about helping you follow better and then ultimately you get to help someone follow better. That's what we do. Equipping is the task of helping another believer become the finished product. So let me ask you a question and I, I'm gonna ask you, don't, don't, please don't raise your hand. But I'm gonna ask you to answer inside. Do you want to become who God wants and intends for you to become? Because honestly, unless you're saying yes, you're going nowhere spiritually. Our task is to equip. Our target is the church. Well, who's the church? The church are those that are here today and those who will be here tomorrow. In other words, it's those that have already responded to the gospel, like people like you and I, and those who will respond to the gospel. In fact, it's a big reason why we actually did the Share series, to help you understand how you could take this amazing story and put it in your own language, your own words, to be able to share it with other people so that they could respond to the gospel. The church is not just a gathering. The church is a supernatural connection and collection of people. John Stott, who was a great theologian, had a great term for the church. He called it God's new society. And don't get that mixed up with, you know, LBJ's great society. This is God's new society. The church is a new society built by God. Jesus in Matthew 16, 18 said, I will build my church. And that is exactly what God is doing. The church is made up of people of every race, every color, every age, every ethnic group, every social group, people of every tribe and every, tri and every tongue that will come together into a brand new family, a new society, a spiritual family built by God. In every way, that connection and that collection are miraculous. You wanna know when you really see it, that like at work? When God opens up an opportunity for you to go overseas and you do that, and you serve, you witness one of the most amazing miracles ever. For example, I'll give you, I'll give you a perfect example. As a church, we have been tied into Haiti for a long time, at least 10 years. And I, I got to tell you, it's an amazing partnership. We've had a chance to train 80 pastors, how to teach through God's word. When we first started going, you know, one pastor would take a verse and he would beat up his people, you know, for a while. And, and then and they've been through this whole thing. And there's 80 guys that are down there right now teaching verse by verse through the scriptures. It's, th it's, it's a thrill for us. We get a chance to help build a medical facility there with chances for children, a dental facility there to be able to come alongside and be involved in these feeding programs. And I'll tell you what, you only need to go one time for God to so grab your heart to see this because when you walk into some village and a little kid has a bloated belly out of here and his hair's falling out, you don't care about the car that you're thinking about buying right now. You only care about God, what is it you want me to do right now? God intertwined these, these, these people together in such an amazing way, the people from our group and the people from Haiti into this love relationship. We didn't speak the same language. We didn't you know, see the same movies. I mean, but yet there was something totally and completely supernatural there that drew them together to say, that's my brother and sister. And that's why we're committed to doing that. That's why we, we care about organizations like Convoy of Hope, that, that they don't care that there's civil war going on in Haiti, they just hire more guns. But they're gonna bring the food in to feed those babies in those feeding situations. That's, a, that's miraculous stuff. 
Years ago, Tyler and I took a couple hundred high school kids to, to Washington, D.C. to do this evangelistic street thing, you know, that was part choir, part band, and, and on drama that all happened on the street. And we had done a couple of performances, and we were, you know, the last one we were doing there was at the bottom of the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, right where the reflection pond is right there. And, and as we were, you know, doing our, our thing, a couple hundred people gathered around to watch their performance. There was a huge group, uh, probably like five busloads full of people from Korea that were there that, that gathered around us in that thing. And when we came to the very last song that we were singing, all of a sudden this huge group of Koreans started singing with us in Korean. I don't know if you've ever experienced heaven, but heaven on earth, that was, it's amazing. That's the church. It's not just a gathering. It's, it's something absolutely supernatural. And it happens when you're born into God's family. The church is a place where, you're, where you're, you're loved and you love others. It's a place where someone will walk with you when you're down and you walk with them when they hurt. It's a place where you get taught truth, a place where you can gather together with brothers and sisters and worship our Father together as a brand new society. That's why a church can form or start or exist in a home or a school or a warehouse because the church isn't a building, it's the people. It's God's new society. So our task is to equip, our target is the church, our destination is to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. That means we're not committed, I'm gonna tell you right now, we're not committed to doing the coolest thing and we're not committed to doing the biggest thing. What we're committed to is being his voice and carrying the gospel message. We're committed to carrying a message of hope and forgiveness and encouragement. We're committed to being his hands. So when someone falls, we lift them up. We're committed to being his feet. So if there is a need and no one else will walk that distance, that we want to be the people that do that. We're committed to being his resources and that means people give to expand the kingdom so that the message and the hope of the gospel will go out. Following Jesus is more than simply believing. It is living out faith. And that means we're going to ask you to serve. We're gonna ask you to take your place as a part of the family. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I have the expectation that you will serve. Because following Jesus means we care for other people, not just for ourselves. Paul in Philippians chapter two, verse four says, don't look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. That's why when opportunities arise for us to make our lives count in other people's lives, we jump at the chance. So like in September this year, when we have a chance to do Feed My Starving Children, this September we will you know, be blessed enough to pack our three millionth meal. Because you know what, there is something amazing and special about you walking into one of those villages where a kid is hungry and realize, you know, me and my children packed this meal. So it's a great thing. We wanna be a part of that. We want you to be a part of that. Following Jesus is not natural. Gathering together, growing together, serving together, sacrificing together, these are the qualities of a new society, a supernatural family. Following Jesus is not, excuse me, let me say this differently. Not following Jesus is not optional for believers. You know, the gospel records Jesus asking people to believe in him five times. But it records Jesus asking people to follow him 20 times. We do not follow the world system. We do not follow culture. We follow Jesus. That changes everything. As a people who desire to be Christ followers, this is not optional. 
I need to find and fulfill my purpose in life. I need to be equipped and help equip others to follow Jesus because it's more than simply loving God and even loving people. It's also about building into them and helping them to make their walk successful. As men and women saved by God's mercy and grace, we have no right to live visionless and purposeless lives. Now, you may be saying, wow, that's... That's a pretty radical statement. Yeah, it is. But what part of the Father sending his son Jesus to this earth to die on a cross for stuff we did is not radical? What part of the Father taking his Holy Spirit and planting him inside of and living inside of us is not radical? The greatest tragedy this side of death will be for you to miss God's purpose for your life when you know God had created you for more. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our challenge here, folks, is this, to take the years that God has endowed us with on this earth the gifts, the resources that he has entrusted us with and to passionately pursue his mission for my life. The question is how? How do you do that? Well, we've worked really hard to simplify a path, to give you doable steps, steps we believe are biblical. And so I'm gonna ask you to turn over with me to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. I want to walk you through the description of the very first church in Jerusalem there that is completely fulfilling the mission. Acts chapter two, look at verses 42 through 47. Verse 42 says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's a biblical outline of a church that loves God, loves people, and is making disciples. Now, let me see if I can break this down into some doable steps for you, okay? Now, while I'm doing that, let me ask you if the, if the worship team would come back and join me. I'd really appreciate that. Let me give you doable steps here, okay? The first thing you see here is if you go back to verse 42, is that they were participating. They were participating. It says they were devoted to, the, to God's word and the teaching and to the fellowship. In other words, they were participating. And it's in participating that something amazing happens. If you bring your Bible and, and you, you worship together, but you bring your Bible and you're tracking along with us, you're going to grow because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You'll grow in your love for the Lord, but you'll also begin to grow in love for this other people as you're worshiping together, and we're all singing to our Father together, and you know what? You're gonna have the chance to maybe lead in some way, maybe serve in here in some way, or or invite someone else, and you'll be about the part of making disciples. That's what we wanna be about. The second thing here, as you see, is in verse 46. It says they were connecting. It says they were gathering together in each other's homes. They were connecting. They were still doing a study, and so they were growing personally in their own faith. But now, as they interact with one another about the passage and what does it mean for their lives, man, our hearts go out to these people as we're talking about, what does this mean? How do we do this? They grew together. And again, some of them will step up and lead and others will invite people and so they're they're, they're about the whole thing of making disciples. 
You see, connection is why the church isn't to be done alone in isolation. You need to be a part of a body in a group where you can know and be known. The third thing you realize here is in verse 42 is they were serving. They were devoted to the breaking of bread and and serving one another. Verse 43, and many signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. In other words, the apostles at that point were actually modeling service for them. You know, it's in service that we really prove our love for the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I said. Loving him means serving other people. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 says, little children, let us not love in word or talk. In other words, don't just say you love. But he said, but indeed in truth. It's why God gave us spiritual gifts. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And so the passage is clear that they were participating, they were connecting, they were serving. But fourthly, verse 45 says they were investing. It says, verse 45 says they sold, they were selling their possessions and distributing as any had need. That's investing. You see, in investing, we really do love God, love others, and make disciples. When we give obediently, you love God. When you give sacrificially, you love others. When you give to build the kingdom, you're a part of God's family. That was a great church. The result was, verse 47 says, the Lord added to their number daily. Does that not sound like a church you'd want to be a part of? But it requires that you and I be equipped and that we equip. And we're committed to doing that. That's our vision. Equip the church to follow Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, Father, it's my heart's desire that we would see a group of people that would step forward and decide they want to trust you and walk with you. They want to become the men and women that you've called them to be. That they'd not simply rest and and say, you know, I just want to get into heaven. Because they've missed, they've missed all of the New Testament, God. They've missed the fact that it would mean, what does it mean to walk with you and serve you and honor you? But Lord, as a church, that we would have the great honor of seeing you work in a very powerful way. So Father, move in our hearts. Move in our hearts, God, to make us your servants, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our desire is to help you become who God intended for you to be. Our prayer is that you have that same desire And if that's the case, we have doable steps for you. Part of it is doing what you're doing right now, is worshiping the Lord and and getting in God's word. And we pray you'll continue and you'll grow in that and you'll invite others and be a part of that. But you know what? There's some really important things that need to happen here. For example, you need to get into a group. Life wasn't meant to be done alone. Get it, sign up for a group. We have people out there right now in the lobby over here on this side on the north end. Sign up, take a chance, get into a group. Over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be talking about all the different service opportunities. Sign up to serve, be a part of the family, take your place within the chores that a household has. Do that and invest. Invest. Put your heart on the line, invest. God bless you. Love you all. Have a great day.